good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we hold our traditional uh, research uh, seminars, and uh, we are really pleased to see how many people have been attracted by the event. And uh, I hope to get really fruitful and comprehensive discussion today. So, uh, today the Director of uh, Monetary Policy and uh, Economic Analysis uh, Department of the National Bank of Ukraine, uh, Sergei Nikolaychuk, uh, will uh, present the results of uh, the joint project entitled uh, Equilibrium Interest Rate in the case of uh, small open economy application for Ukraine. Uh, before uh, Sergei starts, uh, I would like to mention that uh, uh, to carry out this uh, investigation, uh, Sergei uh, uh, teamed up with uh, his colleagues, uh, uh, Volodymyr Lepushinsky, the head of uh, Monetary Policy Department, and uh, uh, Anton Gruy, the chief economist of the uh, Modellian Division. Uh, so, uh, don't want to waste your time and just get down to the presentation, please, Sergei. Thank you very much, Andrei, for this introduction, and uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great pleasure to host you here at the Central Bank, and I hope that uh, really this topic, uh, equilibrium interest rate uh, for Ukraine, so it's, uh, I should say that it's a very policy relevant topic and uh, at, the same time, at the same time we put as much as uh, possible efforts in order to provide uh, the contribution to policy making based on international experience but also based on our investigation of this, uh, uh, of this area. Uh, so during today's uh, presentation I will cover uh, a few areas. No, first of all, I will start with the motivation. Why do we need to, to have the estimates of the equilibrium or neutral or natural interest rates? Uh, uh, of, after that, I will briefly discuss the findings in literature we were able to discover. And also, after that, I will put attention to the methodology used uh, in our research, starting from the analytical framework and, uh, and uh, following with the model we used for uh, our estimation. And, of course, I suppose the most interesting part, that is the results for Ukraine we obtained from this research. And, uh, uh, how do we see the situation now, how do we see the situation in the uh, medium, medium, medium term and uh, of course uh, we would like also we would like to, hire, uh, to compare our results with the results from other studies and for other countries and of course I will conclude. Uh, I hope everybody knows what is, what is it the equilibrium or neutral interest rate. So, you know, in the economy, people uh, usually would like to, to talk in very simple, uh, in very simple um, manner. So, especially if you, if you, if you talk with a policy maker, yeah, uh, very often you are, you are asked about some um, assessment, assessment of the current situation in the simple, simple words. And actually this concept of neutral or equilibrium interest rate, that is, the, uh, that is the approach when you try to explain quite sophisticated, complicated issues in a very simple manner. So uh, the idea is that there is some equilibrium, yeah, non-observed level of interest rate in the economy, and if the central bank keeps uh, its policy rate, uh, uh, for, uh, keeps its policy rate above this level, so uh, it's, there is a suggestion that uh, so the central bank conducts quite tight monetary policy. Uh, mm, directed to some contractionary uh, and has some contractionary, contractionary uh, efforts. And if the central banks would like to lose monetary policy, would like to provide some stimulus to the economy, in that case uh, key policy rate should go 
uh, should go below this uh, neutral level and, uh, and provide some stimulus to the economy. And, of course, the concept is very, very, uh, very simple, yeah, by nature, but the most tricky issue that's how to assess, to esti how to estimate this equilibrium or uh, neutral, neutral level. And why do we need it uh, for, poli uh, for policy issues? Probably everybody, everybody in this room knows about the Taylor Rule and uh, how the central bank sets its uh, policy rate. And uh, you may see here on this slide uh, this very famous formula. And uh, this uh, neutral real interest rate that is the core of this concept. Again, if the central ba bank wants to provide some additional stimulus to the economy, so and uh, usually that is needed if uh, the central bank sees uh, observes that the forecast, forecast of inflation is uh, below the target and uh, economy, uh, economy is uh, below its potential level. So in that case, the central banks have, uh, has to uh, decrease its interest rates below the level of the, of the neutral uh, real, real interest rates. And of course, in the opposite situation, if the central bank observes that inflation forecast is above the target, if it observes some overheating of the economy which could be characterized by positive output gap, definitely in that situation the central bank has to rise the interest rate, its policy rate above uh, the neutral, neutral uh, level. And this topic of uh, equilibrium real interest rate uh, attracted wide, wide scale attention in the literature just recently. Uh, and this situation was most probably uh, was fueled by the situation in advanced economies, where you may observe for many years that uh, the interest rates were very low, were very low we are below zero or we are, uh, near the zero level or some countries, some central banks even put uh, the interest rate, in their key policy rates below the zero level. But at the same time, uh, at the same time, this stimulus, uh, we are not able to provide a significant push to advanced economies yeah, in terms of uh, recovering from, uh, fast recovery from recession in terms of uh, providing additional, uh, additional uh, stimulus for inflation dynamics. And one of the explanations, one of the most popular explanations of such situation in advanced economy was the fact that uh, many researchers uh, came to the conclusion that uh, actually the neutral uh, interest rate, uh, neutral interest rates uh, in these ad advanced economies fell also very significantly. And even putting uh, and uh, setting the interest rate, key policy rates on very low level was not enough to, to boost uh, the, uh, the economies. And uh, we also apply the same approach, very popular approach uh, in recent years uh, in the literature to the Ukrainian data. Again, in order to facilitate the monetary policy decision making at the National Bank of Ukraine. And uh, if we come back to the literature, yeah, uh, so the concept of the equilibrium or natural real interest rate, actually it's quite old. So it uh, originally it was uh, set up by uh, Wixel, a Swedish economist uh, who in uh, 1898 determined the natural rate of interest as the uh, as, the interest, uh, as the interest rate which is um, consistent, with, uh, consistent with the marginal rate of, of return on physical capital. And uh, actually, so his idea, his main idea was that uh, the real, uh, uh, real credit rates should be determined by the level of the, uh, by the productivity of the capital, yield of the capital in, in production. So actually, Wixel uh, uh, determined the natural rate in the, I, I would say, in the real sector of the economy. And his idea was that if, for example, banks uh, 
um, do some credit expansion, so provide cheap uh, loans. In that case, the commodities, it, it, it creates some additional demand for commodities and prices go, uh, prices go, go up. And uh, in the opposite direction, in the opposite situation, if the commercial banks provide uh, expensive loans to the economy, shrink uh, the, uh, the credit supply, so in that case uh, they can put some drag on the economy and push the prices uh, or inflation down. And uh, actually this idea was developed further by, by Keynes in 1936 who uh, determined so-called neutral or optimum rate of interest uh, which on his opinion uh, prevails in equilibrium where output and employment are such that elasticity of employment as a whole is zero. So if we put uh, this concept in the today's, uh, today's words, so it will sound like uh, the GDP should be on its potential level and, uh, and of course in that case if we, if we continue, continue further, yes, so in our case inflation should be on the target level. So uh, if we move to the Keynes concept, so this neutral, neutral level Neutral rate is determined on financial markets and that is, the le uh, that is the rate which is actually balances savings and investments. Today's, nowadays, actually these concepts are very, very often mixed and many people when they talk uh, equilibrium or natural or neutral interest rate, they actually, the, so they mean uh, the same, the same, uh, the same rate. And uh, today, this concept of the medium term, medium term equilibrium interest rate, rate prevails um, in the literature, and people usually define it as the short term, short term risk free uh, interest rate, which is consistent with the output on its potential level and inflation on the target level. And there is also another concept, uh, I would say, I would call it more short-term concept, which is uh, proposed by Woodford, who claims that uh, the equilibrium, the equilibrium or neutral level, that is the level which is determined uh, when all uh, shocks disappear uh, immediately. So that is the level which, is, which should be uh, determined in the current period. Yeah, but uh, usually people, uh, people when they talk about the equilibrium or neutral interest rate, they determine it as the, uh, as the level which is consistent with uh, the shocks uh, disappearing in the medium term. Okay, that, are, that were just theoretical concepts. But again, the main issue how to assess, how to estimate uh, this uh, non-observed uh, level of interest, equilibrium uh, interest rate in the real life. So usually, uh, usually four uh, directions of methods for, uh, for are, are used for these purposes. The most popular probably that is using some semi-structural model, usually estimated uh, with uh, application of Kalman filter. And uh, this, uh, this type of analysis got uh, popularity, huge popularity after the paper of Laubach and Williams in 2003, which estimated the natural, uh, uh, natural rate of interest for uh, US economy and also for, uh, for an, uh, other advanced economies. And uh, if we, if we uh, tried to apply me their method for, for, for Ukraine. So there is one problem. So usually this method, uh, so again, the, the model they, they used in their, in their paper, it's, uh, that is, uh, it's used very well uh, closed, uh, large closed economies, yes. Yeah? So, and uh, and uh, there is some COVID, COVID to use such model for Ukrainian case, but again, we will talk about that a little bit later. Also, some people just, you know, if you want to, to estimate some trend variable, you just put some statistical filter on the data, apply it and get the results. And some people do that for just uh, as 
very simple approach. But of course, if we look at the Ukrainian real interest rate, which was determined in the past by very, uh, very volatile interest rate and very volatile inflation, so the uncertainty in the results will be huge. You, you, you can't just uh, rely on, the, on, this on, me on this method. Uh, another uh, approach, uh, another approach is to use quite sophisticated DSG models and impose uh, strong theoretical restrictions. And actually, this method is usually used by uh, by the people who want to use this uh, short-term concept of the interest rate introduced by uh, by Woodford. So they try to find the interest rate rate which is consistent with the uh, uh, with the um, output on its potential level, so when all shocks should disappear in the current quarter, for example. And uh, also, the usually, usually in the literature, in the literature researchers uh, put attention on such caveats of such uh, approach uh, as very strong theoretical restrictions, which quite often lead to misspecifications and also lead to too volatile uh, outcomes that may be not the, bad, the best case for Ukraine. Another very promising method to estimate uh, the uh, equilibrium interest rates, that's, that is extracting the information from the fina financial data, from the financial market. Yeah, usually people, uh, researchers use uh, the prices of uh, different uh, bonds uh, with different maturities and apply again and try to, try to find some common common trend in these prices in order to get the information about the, uh, about some equilibrium about some trend in this data and uh, trend in interest rates. Uh, unfortunately, financial markets are still quite undeveloped in Ukraine and data sample with, again, if we look at our data and uh, the data sample with active monetary policy is quite, quite short and today, I, 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 uh, my personal opinion, it will be very difficult to get such reliable information from our financial market prices. But probably for the future, that is a good uh, area for research and uh, taking, into account, uh, taking into account quite high speed of uh, developing, uh, development of such markets in Ukraine now. So, um, I would like to highlight again, so we are going to apply uh, this, the first approach, but of course, uh, but of course we are going to uh, adjust it for, for, the Ukrainian, for the Ukrainian case. But before going into that, I would like to show you some results, uh, results uh, of estimating, uh, estimating equilibrium interest rates in the global economy and to provide you with some stylized facts on, uh, on uh, their dynamics. So on the left side, you may, you may see the results from very, again, very famous, very popular paper of uh, Holston, Laubach and Williams published last year where uh, these uh, prominent researchers estimated interest, equilibrium interest rates for advanced economies. I already pointed out your attention to this, uh, to this fact that uh, interest, equilibrium real interest rates in advanced economies fell quite significantly uh, during the last decade and again it, it, uh, it created uh, huge, huge problems for monetary policy in these countries. Uh, uh, in order to stimulate uh, the economic activity and in order to push inflation up. Uh, the main explanations of this fact, of this fact uh, uh, by these authors and by many others actually, that is the shift in demographics, you know, about the aging population in advanced economies and usually <coughs> a, uh, elder people, so they, they have some capital already so they are, sa uh, they are savers usually, and at the same time they are, uh, they are not eager to, uh, to, to spend this money. Uh, and that creates some general savings, uh, savings glut in, uh, glut in, the, uh, in the economy. Also, this additional excess savings could be created, actually, okay, many people, many researchers, uh, 
link these excessive savings in the global economy with the, uh, with the Chinese economy development. You know, probably that uh, in Asia, especially in China, yeah, that many people have, no, so, uh, have very, very high saving rates. And uh, because of that fact, uh, China has a huge surplus in its current account and uh, with the uh, development of China, with uh, increasing its role in the global economy, definitely it uh, pushes uh, the global uh, sa savings rates. And of course, uh, taking into account uh, the results from the global financial crisis, uh, so many countries observe uh, fall in the, uh, in the productivity growth, and of course, it also uh, decreases the demand for demand for capital, demand for funds. And that that fact also contributes to this uh, uh, additional excess of savings in the global economy, and that, that of course. It, this fact also t uh, mm, uh, transmits into the emerging markets. So on the, on the right slide, you may see the recent uh, ongoing project by uh, uh, Stefanski and who uh, tried to assess, uh, tries to assess the equilibrium real interest rate for uh, Central Eastern European countries. And you may see the results that also in average during the last five five, seven years, the interest rates were much lower in these countries. Equilibrium rates were much lower compared with the uh, decade of 2000s. And actually the same factors contribute like uh, lower potential growth, lower per population growth, which leads to uh, population aging, and also convergence to the developed uh, economies also contributes to, to, to the fact that uh, currently the equilibrium, <coughs> equilibrium real interest rates are considered to be in the range uh, from zero to two percent, depending on country. Okay, uh, that was like theoretical concepts that, 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 we were, uh, that we were findings in the literature we discovered. But uh, when we uh, looked at the literature, you know, many, almost all researchers use, use the same approach. So uh, they try to use this uh, left plot as the main uh, framework for, for their research. So they have some uh, investment uh, function which depends uh, negatively on uh, interest rates and they have of course some saving function which depends positively <coughs> on real uh, real interest rates and in equilibrium we we have the dot the yeah dot equilibrium dot where savings uh, equal to uh, investment okay that's 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 fine if you if we consider a large closed economy but if we come to the small open economy, what is the difference here? Okay, I completely, no, I completely agree, agree, agree that the form, the shape of investment function should be approximately the same. So, so investments in our country depend crucially on, uh, crucially on the real interest rate in the country, yeah? on, the, on the price of capital. But at the same time, if we talk about the uh, supply of the capital, supply of the funds, so Ukraine, uh, Ukraine actually is very open economy in, in financial account as well, even despite the fact that capital controls are quite tight. So uh, many Ukrainian companies can acquire the capital uh, abroad, uh, so the banks can, can be intermediaries which can transfer the global capital to the Ukraine. And in that situation, Ukraine actually acts as a small open economy. The situation here does not differ completely from the situation when we talk about the, for example, about commodities market. Yeah. So the pr Ukraine uh, acts like price taker here. So the price of capital for Ukraine is completely determined by the global condition. Conditions. There is a global supply of funds, which is determined on the left plot, yeah, by the by the level of global savings and investments, and we. We just take this uh, price, Ukrainian economic agents just take this price uh, as given. But 
What is crucial here, of course, that is, uh, that is domestic factors which determine how this price is adjusted for the Ukrainian economy. Crucial, uh, crucial factor here is risk premium. Definitely, uh, for Ukrainian economic agents, for Ukrainian corporates, for Ukrainian uh, government, the price of capital on the global markets will be a little, a little bit different uh, compared with the, for example, European, European economic agents. And, uh, and uh, actually, risk premium, that is the factor which uh, determines this, this difference. And also, at the same time, at the same time, we have to adjust, uh, if we talk about the real interest rate in Ukraine in national currency, we have to adjust it to the change in the, uh, in the exchange rate. Uh, I will uh, describe this, uh, this concept uh, on the next slide, but here I would say that this uh, idea of, uh, of the global price for small open economy is not unique, actually. So, for example, in the, uh, in the paper for Canadian economy, we, we observed the same conclusion by offer that no, no, neutral rate in Canada would be determined solely by global factors. But, of course, uh, but of course re, uh, risk premium and uh, change, the change rate matter for, for, for the final results. Okay, let's, uh, let's try to uh, understand and for me to explain yeah, why uh, change in real exchange rate uh, matter. So, again, uh, the price for Ukrainian enterprises, for Ukrainian businesses or for the government in, uh, in dollar terms, for example, they are determined by the global factor real neutral interest rate in the global economy and also by risk premium. So, at, and in the left side of the equation, we actually have the real neutral interest rates for Ukraine, but, but in, in dollar terms. Let's, uh, uh, let's put it in these words. But at the same time, you know, investors which, uh, for example, put some money into Ukrainian, uh, into Ukrainian assets, they can get, uh, in, in local currency, in Grimia, yeah, they can get their revenue, their income from two sources. First, from the interest rate, but also from some change in the, in the exchange rate. Let's assume, let's just, that the, the price of uh, global capital for Ukraine in dollars adjusted for risk premium is uh, 5%. Yeah, 5%. And for example, they, these investors can get 10% uh, in grimness. And uh, if we have some equilibrium yeah, here, so in the, at, the, at this point they have, so Ukrainian currency should devalue by 5% in order to get this 5% in dollars. Uh, otherwise we are not in the equilibrium. And that is actually the cornerstone of our research, the main analytical framework, I would say. And, of course, in order to put this analytical framework in some model, in some force to estimate, uh, to estimate on, on data, so uh, uh, this framework, we need some model, yeah? And we explore for our purposes uh, our quarterly projection model, which is actually, that is our core and macroeconomic model, which we use for our forecasting process and for policy analysis and so on. And that is a small semi-structural model of a new Kine Keynesian type with rational expectation, expectations. It's not a full uh, structural mod model, which is based on micro, uh, microeconomic pro principle as, as, for example, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, but uh, actually it, uh, it, it is like the derivative for, from such model. It has the same uh, principles, uh, principles uh, behind uh, the idea of this model. It has uh, forward-looking variables. Uh, and thus, it is not uh, the subject of Lucas critique, so it could be used for the policy analysis. But at the same time, it has quite a uh, ad hoc structure, which, uh, which and th this fact helps us to use it for, 
uh, for different purposes and to, to fit Ukrainian data much better with, with for example, uh, DEG models. Actually, this model is quite popular uh, globally. Uh, its origin comes from the UPM of Canadian banks and nowadays, and Czech National Bank, and nowadays similar models are explored uh, by many central banks around the world. Just Serbia, Armenia, Slovak Republic, many others, uh, many other countries uh, use the same model. And the main idea of this model that it puts the main focus on uh, policy transmission mechanism, monetary policy transmission mechanism, and uh, um, investigating how the um, change in uh, uh, policy monetary, monetary instrument, instruments uh, transfer to the real sector of the economy in the short and medium, medium term. And at the same time, uh, and at the same time um, so this model reflects a monetary policy neutrality in, in the long run. Um, okay, and con the concept of this model, that is the state uh, space representation of macroeconomic variables, where we, uh, where we work with trends and gaps which are unobservable variables, or unobservable components which are estimated with the Kalman filter. I have a few slides here describing the main equation of this model. Again, they are very standard, like for any uh, reasonable macroeconomic, macroeconomic model. So that is the uh, equation for the output gap in, in the form of uh, IS curve. The uh, output gap depends on monetary condition conditions which include uh, real uh, exchange rate gap and uh, real credit rate gap. Uh, also, our, our output gap depends on the, uh, some pressure from demand which we uh, describe by real wage gap. And also, from uh, our output gap depends uh, quite significantly on external factors such as terms of trade and uh, uh, growth uh, output gap in our main trade partners. And also we have fiscal impulse in order, again, to model, for example, some, uh, some impact from fiscal policy. Also we have a, a Phillips curve in our model, again, quite traditionally, where inflation depends on expectations depends on exchange rate and also depends on the pressure from demand side, so which is described by the output gap. And we have a very similar equation for different components of inflation, uh, for uh, raw food inflation, for also for administrative inflation and for fuel, and all them together composite headline inflation. And very important equation in our model, that is uh, UIP, uncovered interest parity, which links together the change in the exchange rate and uh, nominal interest rates. So again, if we describe it in very simple words, this uh, UIP, it means that when you compare the interest rates in different uh, currencies, they have to take into account the change in the, in, in, uh, the change in exchange rate. So if you, for example, if your interest rate is 12.5% in Grivnia, and if, your, um, uh, and if uh, the interest rates in US dollars is, uh, for example, 1%, yeah, so this difference, 11.5%, it, uh, it should be devoted either or, uh, to uh, expected depreciation of the currency, or to the additional risk premium. So at the end, you have to come up with the same, uh, the, the, with the same returns in different, con uh, in different currencies. And this uh, equation, actually, it explains the dynamics, the impact by the central bank, by the monetary policy, by change in interest rate on the change rate. Uh, usually, if the central bank increases its key policy rate, it leads to the appreciation of the currency in, in the short term and the medium term. 
And the idea is that in, in increasing the interest rate, you attract the, some inflows of capital into your country and uh, there is, uh, uh, the supply of FX increases. And in the opposite, uh, in the opposite direction, we have the opposite effect. Uh, of course, we, s we have the Taylor rule in our model, which describes how the central bank sets the policy rate. So again, so I will not uh, repeat uh, uh, the story I already described. Yeah, that central bank uh, sets the interest rates uh, depending on the deviation of the forecast of inflation from the target and also on the output, uh, output gap in the economy. And uh, also we have uh, this equation of the uh, changes in change, uh, change in uh, trend real exchange rate against U.S. dollar, uh, which we link to the to the change in the relative productivity of Ukrainian economy compared with the U.S. economy, and also uh, so change uh, in uh, terms of trade in trend. I will explain a little bit later why do we need this, uh, uh, why do we need this equation. Okay, so here is the data we use in our analysis, in our, in our research. So usually when we talk about the real interest rate, so we mean uh, nominal average interbank overnight rate minus mod model consistent inflation expectations. However, we also, in our analysis, use other measures of real interest rate, and I am going to, to show you the results a little bit later. So, for uh, nominal short-term interest rate global, or in U.S. dollars, we use three months LIBOR rate in U.S. dollars, and for uh, neutral interest rate in U.S. dollars, we actually rely on, uh, on the results of the paper I already mentioned to you, Laubach and Williams, uh, and uh, actually this data, this, me this method is used by, uh, explored by the Federal Reserve Bank San Francisco on the permanent basis, and we just uh, take uh, this uh, indicator from their website in order to use this benchmark for, for our estimation. And uh, if we talk about the real exchange rate against U.S. dollar, so that is our nominal exchange rate against dollar adjusted for the change in inflation. And uh, in order to have some indicator of risk premium for Ukrainian economy, we uh, rely on the difference between the yields on sovereign state euro bonds uh, denominated in U.S. dollars and uh, uh, this difference between uh, these yields and between the yields on 10 years U.S. Uh, treasuries notes. Okay, and let's, let's talk about the results we got applying all this methodology, linking this analytical framework, our model, and, uh, and the data. Here, uh, I would like to start with uh, some exogenous uh, uh, exogenous variable for our estimation, the risk premium. As I told you, that is the difference between the yields for Ukrainian euro bonds in dollars and U.S. Treasury, Treasury notes also in dollars. Yeah, and you may see here that we experienced two crises. It, of course, it was, uh, the, these two crises, uh, crises uh, uh, were reflected in the risk premium, and currently, currently, the, this difference between the yields is about four percent, and we are still on the downward, uh, on the downward trend. And uh, okay, uh, also, probably I will uh, I will elaborate on this issue a little bit later. That is, that is the, uh, our estimates of the change in equilibrium uh, in trend uh, real exchange rate against dollar. You may, uh, and here, so minus uh, uh, values, uh, minus values stand for uh, real appreciation and the plus values uh, state for, stand for real depreciation of our currency. And you may see, for example, that before the global financial crisis, so we experienced an uh, appreciation trend, and which was mainly caused by the 
higher productivity, productivity growth in Ukrainian economy compared with the uh, U.S. economy. After the global financial crisis and, uh, actually, and before 2016, that was the depreciation trend caused both, uh, by, uh, caused both by very low growth in the productivity in Ukraine, which is a little bit strange, but of course, I suppose you know quite well the reasons of such low uh, growth in productivity in the Ukrainian economy, even compared with such country, developed country as U.S. And also at the same time we experience significant negative uh, terms of trade shock, mainly related to the adjustment of the gas price, uh, to the new conditions, to the, to the market uh, to the market level and also at the same time so the green bars they show the impact uh, the negative impact from the global trend of uh, uh, decrease in commodity prices mainly for our steel uh, steel products which is the main component of our of our exports but if you look at the last for five quarters, you may see that uh, currently, currently we have uh, higher growth rates in uh, productivity, in labor productivity in Ukrainian economy. We have some, some small but still uh, positive input from the, from the commodity prices. And, uh, and of course, it also, it, it also pushes our real effective exchange rate, real exchange rate against dollar to, to appreciate. To appreciate. And currently, we, uh, we estimate such appreciated to, appreciations, to appreciation to be about two, uh, two and a half percent, uh, percent in annual terms. And combining all this together, Again, uh, so uh, these uh, red bars, red bars indicate the global global interest rate, and combining all this together, we come up with the estimation of the equilibrium real uh, real rate for the Ukrainian economy. And you may see that before the global financial crisis, this uh, uh, level was quite low, from zero to two percent, and mostly that that such low level it reflected the excessive supply of global liquidity and fast growing economy of uh, of ukraine and here that that is actually um, interesting interesting th thing if you look at the models for the global for for closed economies like for example this uh, this model of uh, laubach williams yeah so the main factors which actually determines the real rate or real interest rate or real uh, rate of return that is the productivity growth and in the case when your economy grows faster there is additional demand for the funds and uh, uh, equilibrium real interest rate goes uh, goes up in the ukrainian case in the case i suppose for many other emerging markets if you have fast growing economy yes it leads to lowering of uh, lowering of uh, risk premium you may observe it here yeah uh, um, green bars and at the same time it it leads to the appreciation of your currency appreciation real appreciation of your currency and that that actually also decreases uh, decreases your equilibrium uh, real interest rate in local currency and if you have the opposite situation, as we have starting from 2009 and ending, for example, in the first half of uh, 2015, so in our case, uh, in our case, huge low, low growth of productivity in Ukrainian economy uh, led to high uh, uh, risk premium, led to depreciation of the real exchange rate, and at the end, uh, so we assessed that the equilibrium, equilibrium real, uh, real rate for Ukraine was quite, quite high, fluctuating from 6 to 15 percent. And if we go to the today's, uh, to the nowadays, yes, so currently we observe that falling real in, uh, risk premium to 4 percent and uh, appreciating real exchange rate uh, lead us to the result of uh, approximately 2%. So that is the level where we see the equilibrium real interest rates today. 
Does it mean that uh, that uh, the central bank has to uh, has to set the interest rate basing on uh, this real interest rate uh, estimation? Probably no, but let's talk about that a little bit later here on this slide. Again, if that these two slides uh, show uh, show uh, us the assessment assessment of monetary policy stance. As you may see, for example, on the left slide, then starting from 2005 and almost to, to, uh, up to 2015, the interest rate, real interest rate, was almost all the time, uh, almost all the time, below and significantly below the uh, real equilibrium rate. And from our point of view, that actually quite uh, well described, uh, describes the situation we observed in that years. Then inflation was quite high. There were, of course, some periods, some periods uh, when we had some liquidity crisis, yeah, and interest rates uh, went uh, went up significantly. But these periods were were quite short, short-lived, and usually they were followed by the by the some series of uh, easing of monetary policy and definitely such low interest rates observed in the ukrainian economy so they contributed to high and volatile inflation but if you look at the situation which uh, was observed during the last two years so it seems that monetary policy was tight enough to ensure rapid disinflation improve expectation and even resist party uh, partially some inflation shocks, for example, observed uh, this year from uh, food prices, food products. And uh, with some trick here, for example, if you look at this plot, you will see that uh, when we estimate, assess the uh, policy stance, we use uh, uh, f before, before the April of 2016, we use the uh, market rate, overnight rate, because Again, so our impression that discount rate, policy rate, was, uh, was meaningful at that time. But starting from the second quarter of 2016, we use uh, for assessing the policy stance our key policy rate, our discount rate, because we think that currently it, it, it better reflects the situation, the cost for funds, uh, risk-free and uh, short-term uh, funds for the banks uh, even better than overnight interest rates, which can uh, deviate because of some idiosyncratic f f factors. That's why we started to use uh, these uh, interest rates to, to describe the situation, the monetary policy stance. Another tricky thing that is actually the inflation expectations we use in order to deflate the nominal interest rates in order to get the real interest rate. So, actually, we presented here two plots. Yeah, on the left plot, you, we, that is the, um, we, uh, the real interest rates which we got by deflating the nominal rate by model consistent inflation expectations. But, again, from our point of view, this indicator is quite volatile because we have this very volatile administrative component in our headline inflation. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, change changed in our real, real, real interest rate just reflects this fact, and it does not, uh, you know, reflect very well the real policy stance. And that's why very often we rely on the uh, real interest rates, which is calculated by uh, using the expectation of financial analysts, professional forecasters, and we take them like the measure of inflation expectations. And you may see from the right plot yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the latest data, and you may see here how, how tight or not tight, I don't know, was the monetary policy. And you may see, for example, that you, during the last two years, in average, in average, the real interest rate was approximately, uh, approximately uh, was above uh, equilibrium level approximately by two percentage points. Okay, that was the description of the history. But 
we also have some part describing our idea what would what what should be or what, what would be probably yeah the result for 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 the next few years actually we try to assess what will be the equilibrium real interest rate in 2000 in 2020 and uh, again what we did we just take the components the, uh, which determine the level of the of the real uh, interest rate in ukraine and try to estimate what, what will be their values in 2020? Well, first of all, maybe the most important component for us, that is the risk premium. Currently, we have 4%, as I described. And our suggestion that we still on the downward trend and in the medium term, we have to, to go to 3%, the level which was actually quite uh, uh, approximate on, on this level, uh, Ukrainian economy, uh, this level Ukrainian eco economy observed in, uh, in the years before the global financial crisis. And that is the level where we actually may see uh, approximately, uh, approximately some average for Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. How, however, this level is a little bit lower, uh, our, and actually our suggestion, if we, if, we, if we take some more longer term horizon, like 10 years, yeah, that risk premium for Ukrainian economy also should go to, to this area, approximately from uh, 1.5 to 2 percentage po points. That is the average for our peer economies, uh, which was observed during the last 10 years. But again, that is the assumption which is very dependent on the success in structural reforms, success in macroeconomic management, uh, and, and so on. And we also try to estimate what should be the equilibrium appreciation of our currency against their US dollar in real terms. For that, we relied on the paper of uh, uh, which was produced by uh, the IMF staff, by the IMF experts, and where uh, these researchers estimated the factors which contribute to, to a real uh, exchange rate change in long run. And we just took the coefficients there and tried to estimate our trends for the next five years. And you may see here, actually, so the main the main factors which contributed to our estimate were uh, relative, uh, relative uh, growth of Ukrainian economy against the US dollar and also relative uh, population grow growth, which is actually negative for the Ukrainian economy and contributes negatively to the appreciation of our currency against the uh, dollar. And also at the same time, we took into account the fact that the uh, uh, the Central Bank of Ukraine, the National Bank of Ukraine, uh, will intervene quite heavily during the medium term period in order to accumulate the reserves. So we also took into account these facts and we come up with the estimate of 3% appreciation. Currently, as far as if you remember, we have 2%, yeah, 2% appreciation of the equilibrium, equilibrium exchange rate against, uh, against dollar in real terms. So, and, and all, that is also the picture we tried to compare Ukrainian situation with uh, our neighbors, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, and the appreciation of their currencies in the 2000s and during the last two years. And actually, uh, our, estimate, uh, our estimate looks uh, quite reasonable if we rely on this benchmark of such benchmark analysis. And at the end, we again return to this formula, how we calculate the real neutral, neutral rate for Ukraine. And if we put uh, the global real neutral rate at 1%, again, currently it's, a little, it's close to zero, a little bit lower, but everybody expects that with the recovering of the global economy, so this, uh, this rate should, should go up as well. And putting the risk premium on the level of 3% and taking into account real exchange rate appreciation by 3%, we come up with the 
one percent percent real uh, interest rate in, in real neutral rate in Ukraine in the medium term approximately 2020 and on this slide we see how it looks in international comparison so again many countries use different very different methodologies sometimes actually that's not very um, mm, wise <laughs> actually to compare these results yeah uh, but at the same time we we, we we try to do our best yeah for example and uh, you may see if, you may see uh, if we if you take for example the recent the recent papers yeah definitely the the level of equilibrium real interest rates is very low both in advanced economies and in, in emerging economies and our estimate from 2% now to 1% in 2030 doesn't look like some outlier. Yeah, again, but we are talking about more, more, more or less, more or less optimistic baseline scenario. Yeah, where we, the, our, our economy will uh, develop without some significant crisis, without, without new political crisis or escalation of military conflicts and, and all, other, all other things. Okay, let me let me conclude. Conclude. So, this neutral rate or equilibrium rate that is very important variable in certain interest rate by the central bank. Uh, it's very important for monetary policy analysis, for monetary policy making, and actually it serves as a, some benchmark which allows us to make some conclusions on whether the monetary policy is stimulative or restrictive. And of course, that is non-observable, non-observable variable. And in order to estimate it, we use a lot of assumptions, suggestions, and uh, and so on. But at the same time, we rely on a small open economy approach, which is based on uncovered interest rate parity that yields in different currencies uh, should be should be equal if you take into account of course uh, uh, risk premium and also take into account real exchange rate changes and according to our estimates the current level of neutral real rate in ukraine is about two percent and it's going to approach approximately one percent in 2020. what does it mean it means that actually our uh, if we if we have 5% medium term medium term uh, inflation target it means that uh, that in 2020 our nominal interest rate should be 6%. Does it mean that definitely interest rate will be f uh, 6%? I don't know. Probably during during the, the next few years our policy should still be very tight in order to help the economy to adjust to new condition and also to bring uh, to continue to secure a disinflation process and stabilize uh, stabilize expectations close to our medium term inflation targets and definitely this approach is completely different from the monetary policy we explored in the past when the short term interest rates were completely determined by some uh, exogenous factors by capital flows and so on and the central bank had very limited impact on the market rates and in that in that period it led to the huge volatility of the interest rates and actually it contributed contrib contributed it to the high and volatile inflation in ukraine we hope that the change of the approach and and uh, the tight monetary policy for during a few years so at the end will lead will lead to low real interest rates and low uh, low uh, nominal interest rates for the ukrainian economy and that will be the the main contribution of the central bank of its monetary policy to the economic growth okay thank you very much for your attention thank you. And I will be happy to answer your questions. Maybe I have to explain something more. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I think it was slide uh, 
No, it was. Okay, this slide where you had uh, an, an equation with uh, um, inflation and inflation plus one. I think it was like slide 15 or something. I'm just wondering, yeah, maybe the previous one. This no. Well, somewhere you, were, you had an equation in which you had the current inflation. No, it was exchange rate, actually, depending on future exchange rate. And I was just wondering whether you assume perfect foresight by economic agents or what, what kind of sum assumptions you're making there. Actually, actually, uh, that is, yeah, this one. So that is the UIP condition, yeah, so where I, yeah, there are a lot of uh, literature on this topic, which is uh, which is um, discovering which is discovering does uh, this UAP work uh, in the glo in the current world or not? But at the same time, it seems that uh, you know all uh, standard macroeconomic models they are actually based on this assumption that UAP works. And if we look at the Ukrainian experience, I should say that it also it looks like uh, where, is, where is the link, at least some, some link between our interest rates or the interest rate which prevails on the market and the capital flows and the, as a result uh, the exchange rate dynamics. We may observe that on using some micro evidence. Micro evidence. But at the same time, if you look at this equation quite carefully, you, you, will, uh, you will determine that it's not pure UAP condition. So in our case, we also have some smooth mechanism. You may see here that we have two parts to, in this equation. The first part is uh, completely, uh, let's just show, show you it here. Uh, so that is the pure UAP, but also we have this, uh, uh, this link, uh, this one minus uh, alpha three and multiplied by some rule for the exchange rate change. And that is actually the rule how we introduce the fixed interventions the central bank uh, uh, uses to smooth the volatility of the exchange rate. Again, here we talk not about the smoothing volatility or trying to, uh, to, uh, to have the exchange rate on the some predetermined level or in some bands. But that, that is mostly the, uh, the fact that the central bank uses the interventions in order to, to avoid uh, excessive volatility on the market. Yeah, and uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's quite uh, obvious that the central bank has uh, uh, responded not only by the interest rates on some shocks, but also by the fixed interventions. And my colleagues actually last year uh, published the paper on this topic in our NBU Wisnik. They, they used also the same model, the same, the same equation, and uh, they just speculated, analyzed the fact how, how, uh, how the model properties, how the economic behavior changes when you use fixed interventions in addition to your key policy rate as the instrument. My point was that uh, basically you use a leading indicator, right, in an econometric equation. So basically you kind of assume that um, there is no uncertainty. This is not a stochastic variable anymore. So technically, I don't know whether it, it causes any technical problems with estimation or not. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, I understand. Your question is, was more as, mostly about the estimation of this model with the rational expectations. Yeah, so yeah, in our model we have few equations where we use rational expectations. Mm -hmm. That is one of the examples. The same we have actually for, uh, for inflation, where we also have the term which, uh, so inflation depends on its, uh, uh, on its lead, not luck, yeah. And also for, uh, for output gap we have the same, yeah. So, and um, so, and so uh, the model could be solved in the, which if you present it in this, uh, in this way, so it could be solved and after that it could, could help us to produce, uh, produce forecast scenarios. So, uh, uh, actually I am not sure that we may have some conditions under which this model could be unsolved and could create some problems for us, but uh, at least in the environment, in the setup we have, so yeah. There are no problems with solving such models and, uh, and 
and linearizing it and uh, pro producing these scenarios. Just kind of a little bit practical question. Uh, as I understand the equilibrium real rate, which was about 2% at your uh, presentation, uh, it was your estimation about, uh, which is about uh, second quarter 2017. Yes, yeah. the latest. And the, and the third, yeah. uh, how do you evaluate uh, the trend of this equilibrium real estate, taking into account about 5% change devaluation in exchange rate, which was uh, last month, and about 16.2 inflation, which we have annual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this provocative question here. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you, if you look at the at our uh, gap between our actual real interest rate, how we estimate it, and this equilibrium real interest rate, from our point of view, it was quite enough to ensure the disinflation last year to 12 percent inflation and ensure more or less stable inflation, I mean core inflation, for example, in our economy in 2017. And at the same time, this year we, our economy experienced, uh, experienced quite significant inflation surprises, uh, inflation surprises such as uh, supply, supply side shocks, especially for raw foods, and also some shock, uh, some shock, uh, Come, uh, came from the trade trade ban in the beginning of the year, and also some shock, significant shock, I would say, came from the minimum wage increase uh, to twofold increase in, at the beginning of the year, and definitely all these shocks were quite uh, quite significant. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, our assumption that this monetary po policy, quite tight monetary policy stance we provided to the economy. It led to, uh, to improving inflation expectations, so we still have the, this trend on improving inflation expectations, and also it helped the economy to resist these inflation shocks. So again, if you look at the, our core inflation, it, uh, it grew just uh, by two uh, percentage points from 5.8% at the end of the previous year to the current number of 7.8%, but again, if you took into account all these shocks happened during these periods, I, I would say that uh, our inflation was quite sticky, not uh, upwards, uh, up, uh, upwards, yeah. And if you talk about the last developments on a fixed market, I'm, again, I, I don't think that this 4 or 5% depreciation, that is a huge volatility for the Ukrainian economy. So if you look at our exchange rate, it fluctuates in one and in other directions, based on the different, the different flows or uh, fixed flows. And if you talk about the, the last months, uh, mainly it was the result of the season. That was seasonal pattern we experienced in uh, previous years. Actually, we expected that this year the seasonal, fact, seasonal factors should be lower, but it seems that they, they are still quite significant. But uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy should rely very heavily on such short-term short -term movements. But of course, when the next uh, policy, uh, policy, monetary policy decision will be taken, definitely all these factors, all these risks will be taken into account, account in order to determine should we live with this, mon with this gap with this uh, monetary policy stance, or should we revise it upwards or downwards? Uh, let me then uh, ask one more question, uh, the following. We have uh, in the budget, we have 27.2 uh, uh, exchange rate for 2017 and about 29.5 uh, for 2018, mm -hmm. which is about 10% devaluation of WA. Uh, how would equilibrium real rate react to that change in exchange rate? Your expectations, your evaluation? I suppose, I suppose that our equilibrium real rate uh, will 
will not react uh, on exchange rate in the budget anyway. So actually the exchange rate forecast in the budget that is the forecast of Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economy and the government whole. So that's their forecast which is based on their assumptions and uh, maybe it will uh, come true, maybe not, I don't know. So it depends on how assumptions, how reliable are assumptions uh, which were put into this forecast and how reliable their models which they put in their forecast. From our side, uh, from our side, we do not publish or announce our forecast of the exchange rate because we think that's too market sensitive information and we wouldn't like to, to, to use this tool, some verbal uh, interventions in this way. Okay, as, I, as I understand, you say, let's see if the Grivna will evaluate and then estimate uh, its impact on equilibrium real rate. Uh, no, definitely, definitely all, 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 uh, all actions, all, all things happened in the economy, they have some impact on the equilibrium real interest rate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, uh, and of course, uh, the dynamics of the exchange rate, that is one, one part of this uh, transmission, or one part of this transmission. But I wouldn't call the dynamics of the exchange rate as some uh, fundamental factors. From my point of view, the exchange rate, that is the consequence or transmission channel of different factors, different shocks, which are translated into the, into the economy. And we consider it in this way. So exchange rate, that is not, it is not something like the fundamental factors, that is the reflection of different fundamental factors which uh, have impact on the Ukrainian economy and on the equilibrium real interest rate. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, but I have, um, <coughs> you started to say that this equilibrium interest rate is unobserved. Um, and you also mentioned the many different ways to estimate it. But so how, but how do you know that the estimates that we have come up with is a, a good estimate for this period? Is there a way to um, sort of uh, analyze this to get some idea if this is a good estimate or not? So how, uh, I guess, see my the question. Okay, yeah, so in our case, probably you are right that uh, not only the equilibrium, equilibrium real interest rate is non-observable uh, non non variable, but real interest rate, actually it's also quite non-observable variable, yeah, because in order to estimate it, we have to know some, uh, we have to, to have some measure of inflation expectations, yes? And uh, I would say, uh, so, and, Usually, usually we, usually in the in the in the world practice, there are some uh, some mm, uh, methods how to do that. One of the and we used actually uh, two of uh, such methods. The, the first one that is just using the model expectations, model consistent expectations, again which comes from our forward-lookingness of our model, where we have rational expectations, and we may take these expectations into the, into, into the account. Another, another way that is, the, is to use uh, expectations from the, from the some surveys, and we do it on the, on, on the right plot. Again, so we try to look at the real interest rates from different angles and try to, to estimate it from different perspectives to understand what is the monetary policy stance. Because definitely it's not determined only by the monetary policy, by nominal interest rate. Yeah, we agree on that. Probably, maybe, I, we, actually we, we hope on that, that uh, maybe in the nearest future we will have some uh, market, financial market measure of the inflation expectations. Maybe, maybe you know that yesterday 
uh, that, that was agreement between the Ministry of Finance and the government and the National Bank of Ukraine about the reprofiling of the bond in our portfolio. And one part of, the, of these bonds, which you know, the, new, the new issued bonds, will be the bonds with the, uh, which, which link to inflation. And very often such type of bonds in, uh, in global practice, they are used in order to estimate the inflation expectations of the market participants and uh, of market of traders who, who, who trade these, uh, these bonds of the, on the market. And from my point of view, that's the most precise, uh, precise way to estimate the expectations because they come into the price of the financial instrument and that is very costly for, uh, for traders, for analytics, yeah, you know, to, to predict, uh, to have poor predictions of inflations because it's costly. If you don't mind, I would like to ask you about not equilibrium interest rate, but about target interest rate. Uh, according to Taylor rule, which uses the National Bank, uh, I would like to ask you about coefficient of uh, GDP gap and inflation gap. Does National Bank use values of such coefficients, and how do you evaluate them? Uh, why I'm asking it? Because according to my investigation, coefficient of inflation gap is, uh, for you, in case of Ukraine, is 0 0.8, and the GDP gap coefficient is 0 0.04. It's very small, uh, small value. So I would like uh, to know, does National Bank some interp interpret these coefficients and the use uh, in relation of target interest rate? Mm -hmm. uh before uh, before answering, may I ask you how do you uh, how do you estimate these coefficients? Uh, on, on which on which sample? I use non nonlinear uh, least squares. And what is the sample for your estimation? Uh, what what uh, sample you mean? What I include into this equation? Uh, what is the period? Time period. Time period uh, two thousand six uh, to. Second quarter of 2017. Sorry, beginning of the period 2006? 2006. Okay. Um, if you look at our history. And what uh, kind of interest rates do you use for your estimation? Discount rate? Yes. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, on my plots the discount rate of uh, discount rate. Uh, uh, which was set the, by the central bank in the past because uh, my suggestion and I suppose that everybody uh, everybody agrees with me on that that, that at that point before 2015 I suppose discount rate rate played no role in monetary policy and uh, using it for any estimations uh, you, may, you may get different results but the uh, the meaning of these results is uh, close, uh, close to zero. Uh, many people, so that's a very popular topic of research in the global economy, yet trying to estimate the um, policy, reaction functions, uh, policy reaction function used by the central bank. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, you will, if you would like to try to do that for, for, for the National Bank of Ukraine, I would, uh, I would recommend you to use the period only from the second, uh, second quarter of 2016. But definitely the sample, sample, sample will, will be too short your, in order to get any reliable estimates. So, um, and of course, and of course I, I, I'm not surprised that the values you got are very low. But if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you ask, if we come back to the issue of the coefficients we, are, we now use in our policy reaction function, so they are much higher. So of course the, our policy rate should uh, react quite actively on the, on the inflation, uh, uh, deviation, deviation of inflation forecast from the target and also on the output gap. Uh, I'm, 
So we are not ready to, you know, to announce these coefficients for now. And frankly speaking, frankly speaking, uh, very often for Monetary Policy Committee, we, uh, we prepare different policy uh, scenarios, I mean, the different paths for interest rates, which are based on different coefficients, in order to show the policymakers the alternatives, for example, in order to, uh, for example, to answer the question, if we want to inflation to go back to the target in the, in the middle of 2018, so we have to apply these coefficients and we have to, to have such policy, interest rate policy path. If we want to, to inflation to be back to the target uh, at the end of 2018, so coefficients and uh, policy rate should be, and policy, interest rate policy path should be different. And again, that is the, uh, that is the decision of policy makers to decide what are their preferences. Okay. Yes. Uh, if I may, uh, one more question. You never said anything about the precision of your estimates, how, how tight are, are the confidence intervals, and whether you know, they make sense at all. Uh, yeah. Yes, actually we discussed this issue when we uh, wrote this paper yeah, about the confidence intervals, should we put them? And frankly speaking, yeah, so the first idea was to put some intervals to, to get the understanding how, how precise our estimates. But at that, we come up with the idea that it will be very difficult for us to estimate the, some, to estimate this probability, yeah, probability of going in one or in other direction. So, mm, so that is just our median. I would say that that is the median of our, the, more, the most likely outcome of uh, of uh, the estimate. But uh, again. We may do it actually in our model to, to assign different standard deviation for different shocks to different variables, yeah, and come up with uh, some, some target, no, some, some confidence, confidence band. But uh, I, I, our idea was that, uh, you know, this estimation is based on many assumptions. Putting even more assumptions for different components, for different standard deviation, it would just, uh, you know, so the result could be, uh, could be, could be very strange, could be, uh, the, or could be uh, uh, on the level we would like to see them. So it will be some like some cheating. We decided to to, ex to escape from this issue. But but it sounds that you are quite confident about the three percent forecast uh, or whatever one percent in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, that is. I would say that we are very confident on this forecast, which is based on, based on these assumptions. So definitely these assumptions are subject to uncertainty, are subject to different shocks, and uh, definitely, definitely in 2020 uh, the result will be different. But again, I don't know uh, in which direction, uh, because we try to, you know, to have, I would say, balanced approach that this uh, 1%, 1% in 2020 to be our median of our expectations, so, and of our, uh, and uh, the uncertainty assigned to each variable, but. Uh, good day. So uh, nowadays in Japan and USA, cryptocurrencies are allowed as a way of payment. And my question is that, <clears throat> is it possible that, uh, let's say, in five, ten years, uh, they, may be, they may become a global used instrument, for example, by governments, by national banks? And if so, how may it inflict like, monetary policy of future? <laughs> Just imagine. Thank you. Actually, currently we investigate this issue, yeah, and that is uh, unknown, unknown territory. I don't think that everybody in Japan and in the U.S. actually cle clearly understands the consequences. So we may, may, we may make different assumptions and make different scenarios, but in fact, in fact, we have to, to react, react to, to the new challenges, but... Um, uh, nobody knows. 
frankly speaking, what will be what will be the new monetary system? Okay. If there are no questions, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to see you here at the central bank on our next uh, on our next. Uh, research seminars. Maybe I have to announce that on uh, November 6th we will have uh, a pleasure to host uh, the head of research of uh, Swedish, Swedish Central Bank, Riksbank, uh, uh, Jasper Linde, which is very prominent researchers and I encourage everybody, everybody to, uh, to come and uh, to, to listen to his, uh, his presentation on his uh, his paper also on monetary policy and the, the targets the monetary policy of the central bank should should have. So we will announce it uh, a little bit later, maybe in a week or in two weeks, but again, hope to see you again at the Central Bank of Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention.